13 years is a long time to wait for anything. That's how long I've been waiting for Alan Wake 2. The first game is my favorite game I've ever played, and I've been hoping for a sequel to finally find out what happens to Alan since 2010. For their part, the game's developer Remedy have shared in my desire this entire time. Remedy's last two main projects, Control and Quantum Break, both originally started out as Alan Wake 2, but somewhere along the way, Remedy decided that those games didn't actually fit the vision of Alan Wake 2 that they were going for. Sam Lake, the creative director of Remedy, said in an interview that he is glad that this version of Alan Wake 2 is the one they finally got to make which is kind of poetic in a life-imitates-art kind of way since Remedy's past attempts at making Alan Wake 2 mirrors Alan's own failed ventures at escaping the dark place he's been trapped in. I played two playthroughs of Alan Wake 2 on the Xbox Series X, once on normal difficulty and once on New Game Plus on hard difficulty. This video will contain spoilers for the first Alan Wake, as well as Alan Wake's American Nightmare, and the Remedy Connected Universe. I will also talk about the story of Alan Wake 2 in a spoiler section. You have been warned. Alan Wake 2 is one of the best looking games I have ever played. It has the option to play either in quality mode or performance mode, but I honestly never even bothered with quality mode as I will always choose higher frame rate over graphical fidelity. But even in performance mode, it still blew me away with its visuals. The dense foliage of the Pacific Northwest forests that Saga explores and the quirky and quaint small towns of Bright Falls and Watery are realized with so much care and attention to detail that you can practically smell the earthiness of the forest. Forest. Alan Wake 2 has the best depiction of a forest I've ever experienced in a video game, and I love me some forests, both real and fictional. This verdant nature contrasts sharply with the dark, rain-soaked, noir city landscape that Alan finds himself unable to escape from. Flickering lampposts and dingy, dimly lit subways, as well as neon signs on buildings with bright, aggressive graffiti and trash littering the streets sets the gritty tone. Just like The Forest, this is one of the most impressive renditions of an urban environment I've ever seen in a game. Characters are animated well, and the facial animation is also great, a lot better than Controls was. Character models look fantastic, and the clothing has a tangible quality to it that feels pretty unique to me. They feel like real clothes on a character, rather than being part of the model, if that makes sense. Remedy has their own proprietary engine called Northlight, and it's a beast of an engine. However, Northlight has always had this issue with certain reflective surfaces like metal or water, where there's a lot of weird black graininess that just doesn't look right to me. It's the only real blemish with the visuals. The lighting is the real star of the show here. The game is very deliberately lit in all areas. The lighting sets the mood and tone, and lends itself to creating the thick atmosphere of the game. The other piece of that atmosphere is the sound design, which is as good as you'd expect from Remedy. The Taken sound as monstrous and distorted as ever. The guns sound and feel great to shoot because of how visceral the gunshots are. The squawking of seagulls in the distance as you walk across the wet pavement in Bright Falls, as well as how open all the voices sound when in the open, which isn't as easy to do as you'd think. The sound design is really incredible. Remedy had some live action elements in the original Alan Wake, with the messages from Alan and the episodes of Night Springs on various TVs across the game. Since the original Alan Wake, Remedy has added added live action elements to all of their games, including a full-on television show that accompanied Quantum Break's story. That usage felt a little awkward and heavy-handed, but they managed to implement live action elements much more artistically in control, and that usage has carried over into Alan Wake 2, which feels like the culmination of Remedy's experimentation with live action over all these years. I don't think I've ever played a game that so seamlessly blends gameplay with live action before. It's actually pretty impressive just how natural it all feels. The voice acting is excellent across the board with outstanding performances from all the lead characters. I will say though that Saga's voice actor Melanie LeBird doesn't quite manage to pull off the American accent she's going for. Melanie is a British actress with a very apparent British accent when speaking, and you can definitely hear that accent slip through in many scenes across the game. I noticed it before I knew she was British. I thought that the way she pronounced certain words sounded a little strange and then looked up her actress and put two and two together. But for some reason I haven't really heard anyone else mention anything about her accent, so I guess most people won't notice. The game's music is fantastic. Petri Alanko returns from the first game to compose the score for the second game and he hasn't lost a beat. The music this time around is more sparse and less frequent in regular gameplay, as well as being more horror-esque and less melodic. It does fit the tone of the sequel perfectly though, and encapsulates the darker story and world. Remedy actually commissioned several original songs from various artists to use in the game, similarly to how the original 
game used licensed music in between chapters. I imagine Remedy decided to hire people to write songs specifically for the game in order to avoid the licensing issues they had with the first game. Poets of the Fall return as well as the Old Gods of Asgard. Remedy has also had musical sequences in their games before that are generally regarded as the highlight of each game. I'm not trying to be hyperbolic here, but Alan Wake 2 has one of, if not the best, musical sequences I've ever seen in a game. It's glorious from start to finish. Alan Wake 1 framed the game as sort of a TV series, where each part of the game was referred to as an episode, and at the beginning of each new episode there was a recap of the previous episode, like a TV series. Alan Wake 2 ditches that framing device, instead opting to treat each section of the game as chapters in a book, which is quite fitting given the narrative. Unfortunately, Alan Wake 2 did stumble on release with some technical failings. The performance is actually great, with a rock-solid 60 frames per second, but there were a number of audio and visual glitches that occurred throughout the playthrough. The first time I booted up the game, the opening cinematics audio cut out completely about a minute in, and I had to restart the game. This also happened to one of my friends when he started playing on his Xbox. There were a couple times where the audio desynced during cutscenes so that the cinematics were lagging behind the audio. I also experienced some audio cutouts during my New Game Plus playthrough for seemingly no reason and had to restart the game to fix it. Throughout my playthrough, there would be spots in the forest where blackness would just appear appear in the level's geometry like a seam in the level. It didn't really impact my enjoyment of the game to a significant degree, but it is disappointing to see these technical issues, especially considering Control's launch state on the Xbox One, which also had its fair share of technical issues. It's not egregious, but Remedy, you can do better. I've alluded to it before in this video, but now's a good time to mention that you play as two characters in Alan Wake 2, Saga Anderson and Alan Wake. Both characters have their own unique weapons, enemies, and other mechanics specific to them, though most of the gameplay is the same for both characters. Alan Wake 2 is a pretty slow-paced game for the most part. It's a more old-school survival horror experience focused more on exploration, story, and puzzle solving as opposed to combat. It's got more in common with a game like Silent Hill 2 than a Resident Evil 4. That's not to say that the combat is lackluster, but it's not as much of a focus for the game as its other elements. Combat has seen a significant overhaul from the first game and American Nightmare. Those games were much more action-oriented with fast-paced frenetic combat, whereas Alan Wake 2 takes more cues from more modern survival horror games like Resident Evil 2 Remake. The enemies in the game are called Taken and are possessed people and animals that have been taken over by the Dark Presence, some Lovecraftian-style entity that cloaks them in darkness. Enemies cannot be hurt without removing the darkness with the light source, which will primarily be your flashlight. Once the darkness is burned away, enemies are vulnerable to damage. In the original game, Taken had varying degrees of shielding to burn through, where smaller and weaker enemies had smaller shields and bigger and tougher enemies took longer to whittle away the darkness. You could boost your flashlight to make it burn away the darkness faster as well. Alan Wake 2 takes that system and makes it more uniform across the board. Your flashlight's power is now segmented into multiple segments and each enemy takes one segment to burn away the darkness. Your flashlight does not regenerate anymore either. The only way to regain power is to insert batteries. I'm a little torn on this change. On the one hand, it does make your resources mean more when your flashlight can't just regenerate. On the other hand, I do think it makes the flashlight mechanic a little less interesting when each enemy requires the same amount of light to attack. Also, in my experience playing with a controller, it can be frustrating because the flashlight will attempt to lock onto an enemy, but it does doesn't always succeed, and once you start using a segment, it doesn't stop until the entire segment is used, meaning there were a bunch of times where the lock-on just didn't work properly and I wasted a segment of my flashlight. Taken now have bright red weak spots on them that can be shot for additional damage. There's also a flesh peeling system kind of like in the Dead Space remake, where enemy skin and flesh will be blown off by your shots, revealing their bones and muscle. It's quite gruesome. You can dodge enemy attacks, and if you fall and get knocked down, you can also try and dodge follow-up up attacks while on the ground. If you'd rather just bash enemies away with a flailing arm, you can do that too. You can try and sprint past enemies to conserve resources, but neither Saga nor Alan run all that fast. Although you don't run out of sprint like in the first game, where Alan would run out of breath every 5 seconds and slow down like he had severe asthma or something. A lot of combat is functionally the same as the first game, but it really does feel different to play. Most of the time you'll only ever face off against 2-4 to four enemies at once max, with a few exceptions. The pace of combat has also slowed down as well. This game is about making all your shots count. Previously, 
Basically, whenever you took damage, all you would have to do to heal would be to go into the light. And while going into light sources does still heal you a bit, you now have to use healing resources to get back to full health, like trauma pads or painkillers. Everything happens in real time, by the way, so you can't pause the game then heal. It's all done during the action. There are a few weapons that can hurt the Taken without having to burn away their shields first, like flashbangs, rocket flares, and propane tanks, that when shot will explode like a grenade. And regular flares will remove enemy shields and keep them away from you, buying you some time to reload or heal. There aren't any cool rotating slow-mo shots with the flares now though, unfortunately. But your main weapons are your mostly firearms, like Saga's pistol, sawed-off shotgun, crossbow, hunting rifle, and pump action shotgun, while Alan has his revolver, double barrel shotgun, and a flare gun. Unfortunately, Alan Wake 2's combat also suffers from some of the same issues that the original game had, mainly a lack of variety. In terms of weapons, there are only 8 total weapons plus 4 of the, let's call them miscellaneous implements like the flares. It's not a terrible offering when you consider the original game only had 5 weapons, but American Nightmare did have 14. Ultimately, Alan Wake 2 isn't a short game coming in at around 20-25 to 25 hours, and I definitely think that the game could have used more weapon variety. Enemy variety is also lacking, just like the first game. Saga deals with a handful of enemy types throughout her campaign, beginning with your standard Taken that are what I would consider to be the default enemy type. Then there are Speedy Taken, which zip and zoom around the area, throwing axes at you from a distance. Some of these Taken will actually split into two individual Taken when you shine your light on them. She has Taken wolves that circle around and will lunge towards you, as well as these really freaky and unique looking mirror Taken that are more powerful and tricky to deal with. Alan's enemies are Shadow People, that wander around the environment, getting in your way. Most of these shadows aren't actually enemies that will fight you. You have to decide whether or not to use resources to get rid of them quickly, or risk being blindsided by any that might be actual enemies. You can also just shine your light on them without using a flashlight boost and they will eventually fade away if they aren't taken. Alternatively, sneaking past them by moving slowly and turning off your flashlight is an option, however they can slam Alan to the ground if you're not careful enough. Some of these enemies can also shoot out a darkness missile which can be a pain in the ass to avoid. Alan only ever fights these shadow people. There aren't any more possessed objects or ravens from the first game. There are a handful of boss fights, but I wouldn't say any of them are particularly great. I don't think there's enough enemy variety to last the length of the game, which is kind of funny in a way because I do wish there was a little bit more combat in the game as a whole. I don't mind a slow-paced game, and I love story-driven games, but there definitely were a few points during my playthrough where I was kind of like, hmm, it's been quite a while since there was a combat encounter. And specifically for Alan's sections, there can be so many effects going on like wavy, warping distortions around the shadows, as well as all sorts of particle effects that it can be difficult at times to tell what's going on during some of his combat encounters. I do enjoy though how trippy Alan's level design can be. The dark place exists outside of reality, and there were many times where you would, say, descend underground in a subway only to unexpectedly end up back where you came from, or traverse across rooftops only to find yourself on ground level with no possible way of that actually happening. The game does take a little while to get going. It isn't until you switch to Alan for the first time that the game really feels like it's properly started. Once you reach a certain point in the story, you can switch between Saga and Alan whenever you want at certain save points, and play each campaign in whatever order you want to, though I would recommend switching between them each chapter. During exploration with Saga, she can find manuscript pages like in the first game that expand expand on the story and directly influence the narrative, though they are easier to miss than before as they no longer glow silver. She can also find manuscript fragments by following various markings that allow her to upgrade her weapons. Alan can also upgrade his weapons, however he does so by uncovering words of power by following markings that are revealed by light. These words of power can also upgrade Alan himself, like giving him more health. There are riddles that Saga can find throughout each area that once solved reward the player with a charm. These riddles are solved by finding various dolls and placing the correct doll in the corresponding location in regards to the riddle. These charms give little bonuses and effects like giving Saga more health, or some of them can even be used to essentially give you an extra life, although those specific charms are one and done. Various stashes can be found throughout each 
each area, and unlocking them can require anything from finding a key, repeating a specific sequence, or solving a math question that I definitely solved on my own without looking up the answer. Survival horror means inventory management. Saga and Alan both have their own inventory that do not carry over between characters. You can store any extra resources in a shoebox. It's probably like a size 15 shoebox or something. But I will say that I never really felt that strapped for resources until I started a playthrough on Nightmare difficulty while writing this review. The biggest departure from the original game is the addition of the way you progress through the world and narrative for each character, which are intertwined in a mostly organic feeling way. Saga is an FBI agent and as such, she uses her skills and training and other talents to try and piece together what's going on. Saga has a mind place which is actually rendered in real time alongside the level, meaning that if you are in a dangerous area, you can be attacked by enemies while in the mind place. The mind place allows Saga to do a few things, but the main two are access Accessing the case board and profiling suspects. Throughout Saga's story, you will come across various clues that relate to different cases, and you can go to the case board to put these clues in the right place. At certain points in the narrative, Saga will also have to profile characters, which occasionally happens after she comes to a conclusion on the case board. Alan has his own version of the mind place, which is Bird's Leg Cabin, except he doesn't have a case board, he has a plot board. Throughout Alan's campaign, he will come across different plot elements and scenes that he can use to change the environment to progress the story further. It actually never gets old seeing the environment change in front of you in an instant, it's super cool and often looks incredible. Alan also has a lamp that allows him to take light from a light source in the environment and then bring that light to another light source that will change the environment there, like the plot elements do. Instead of profiling, Alan can find echoes that can sometimes be the key to unlocking plot elements. All of this is really cool and interesting on a first playthrough. Obviously, any game that has a stronger emphasis on puzzle solving won't hold up as well on a second playthrough, though at least for Saga, you don't have to interact with the case board for the majority of the game. A lot of the time, you can just keep moving forward without opening the case board until when you finally have to, any clues that have already been solved by the story progression will automatically place themselves on the board, which is a nice touch. And while I do think this stuff is cool, it's not really all that deep. You can't put any clues in the wrong place, the game won't let you. So if at any time you are stuck, you can just mash the clues in every slot until you find the one that it's supposed to be in. Profiling is also basically just a monologue from whatever character you're profiling. Ultimately, I think that these elements of the plot board and case board are less about the gameplay and more about interesting story concepts realized with a fantastic presentation that also have a gameplay element. They aren't mechanically deep enough to be interesting in their own right and only serve to further the story which is fine, however I can't help but feel that if Remedy were going to invest so much into making these mechanics such a big part of the game, they also could have made the mechanics a little bit more interesting. Alan Wake 2 takes place 13 years after the end of Alan Wake 1. You begin the game as Saga Anderson, an FBI agent sent to investigate a brutal murder in the small town of Bright Falls, along with her partner Alex Casey. Once on scene, shit quickly hits the fan when our intrepid agents realize that there is a murder cult called the Cult of the Tree seemingly going around and killing people, as well as supernatural stuff beginning to happen, such as events written about in manuscript pages they find happening in reality. Eventually, Saga finds Alan Wake, the main character of the first game who's been missing for 13 years. Alan, for his part, has been trapped in the dark place this whole time trying to find a way out, which he has apparently accomplished. I will say that while you could probably enjoy Alan Wake 2's story without having played the first game, I think you would be kind of lost for many things that happen in the game. So I would highly recommend playing at least the first game if you plan on playing Alan Wake 2. Obviously, I would also recommend playing American Nightmare as well, and Control, Remedy's previous release as that game also has ties to this one. After launch, Remedy added a new Game Plus mode called The Final Draft, which actually adds new story content and changes the ending. It's really hard to talk about this game's story without spoiling it, so I'm gonna try and say broad thoughts about it for now. Alan and Saga's stories happen in parallel, but not necessarily at the same time so switching between each character will allow you to see how the same events happen for each character. Alan's story involves trying to find a way out of the dark place by writing a story that's being influenced by echoes of the real world that Alan comes across in the dark place, I think. The narrative of Alan Wake 2 is a dense beast to unpack. 
It's full of parallels and confusing time loops and paradoxes and doppelgangers that aren't really doppelgangers and meta-narratives and the same actors playing multiple characters. It's one hell of a literary and artistic endeavor, and for me, I feel like it mostly works. But it is a lot. Like, a lot. Maybe too much, honestly. There are so many plot threads and layers upon layers and time loops and parallels that at some point you gotta wonder whether or not all of this was really necessary to tell this story. The story is very ambitious, but it's also kind of messy and weird and not super tight. On the one hand, that's exactly why I love it. I said in my Baldur's Gate 3 review that I was happy to play a game that felt like it was made by real people, because of how weird and real the world and story and characters felt. Well, Alan Wake 2 makes me feel the same way. This feels like a game that was made by a lot of people who really cared and loved the thing that they were making and wanted to put as much of themselves into it as they could. Just as one example, Remedy is a Finnish company from Finland, and they created a town called Watery that Saga has to visit, which was built by Finnish settlers and is home to various saunas as well as the Koskala brothers who speak with thick Finnish accents while occasionally interjecting with Finnish words. This game is bizarre and unique and personal in the best way. And while the game can be very dark and tragic, there is also a lot of humor and levity here as well. But it's also the reason why I could see someone not liking the game because of how unafraid it is to be itself. It doesn't care if you don't like it. You're along for the ride or you're not. And I definitely was. However, I still think that the game's story could have been tighter or better paced with some of the fat cut off, even though all of that stuff is why I like it so much. In a way, it's kind of strange the way I feel about Alan Wake 2's story. You see, I enjoyed the narrative a lot while simultaneously feeling disappointed about some of the omissions and decisions made. As I previously mentioned, Alan Wake is my favorite game of all time. That game really matters to me, along with its story and characters, and my love for that game has influenced the way I feel about Alan Wake's story to a degree that the average player probably wouldn't share, but I'll talk about that in the spoiler section. Before that, there are things I want to talk about that don't spoil this game's story, but will reveal certain things from other Remedy games. In case you weren't aware, Remedy's games all take place within a shared universe, like the MCU, sort of. So characters from one game can show up in another game. The problem with the RCU, Remedy Connected Universe, is that Remedy doesn't actually own all of the IP that they've created. Remedy developed the first two Max Payne games and Quantum Break. However, both of those IPs are owned by Rockstar and Microsoft respectively, meaning that Remedy can't actually outright bring characters verbatim from those games into their other games. That doesn't mean that they can't reference these games in some very blatant and obvious but totally non-copyright infringing ways. For instance, Saga's partner, Alex Casey, is clearly supposed to be Max Payne. He's voiced by the same actor and played by Sam Lake, who was the face model for Max Payne. And the Sheriff character, Tim Breaker, is supposed to reference Jack Joyce from Quantum Break, a guy with time powers, a time breaker if you will, both played by Sean Ashmore of X-Men fame. Then there are the characters that are actually the same characters from Control because Remedy owns that IP. Ati, the janitor from Control, shows up and actually plays a bigger role than you might expect. Warlin Dor, a character that Alan meets in the Dark Place, was referenced in Control. And Dr. Darling also shows up on TVs and does some stuff. Alright, time for spoilers for Alan Wake 2. Skip to this timestamp to avoid them. I was very hesitant when Remedy announced that there would be two playable characters in Alan Wake 2. I mean, I didn't wait 13 years to play as someone who doesn't share the same name of the game. But I ended up enjoying Saga's parts a little more than Alan's, because her parts just reminded me more of the first game, you know, dealing with the Taken, finding manuscript pages, exploring Bright Falls, and the forests. Although I do find some of the changes made to the way the Taken work to be a little strange. In the first game, whenever Taken were killed, they just disappeared into thin air, but in Alan Wake 2, they don't. Their bodies stay around. And they don't have to wait for nighttime to appear anymore. They are perfectly capable of showing up during daytime, albeit in relatively dark patches of forest. I couldn't find any in-game explanation as to why these changes have occurred, though there might be one that I missed somehow. Alan Wake 2 is also more or less kind of just American Nightmare fully realized. It takes a lot from that game, including time loops, using the manuscript to alter reality to what it says on the page, and Scratch being the main villain, though they do change the way that they present him. I actually think that the reveal of who and what Scratch is works better if you've played American Nightmare, because it plays off of your knowledge of how Scratch was in that game. 
One thing I am disappointed about is that we don't get to see Barry or Sarah. I was hoping when the FBC showed up that Sarah was going to be the FBC agent, but it ended up being a different character. Barry does have a couple sort of cameos in the game, but I would have loved to see him have an actual part to play. I'm not gonna lie, I was disappointed with the game's original ending. It felt very inconclusive after waiting 13 years for the sequel. I do think that the final draft's ending improves it, but I guess I'm not sure how I feel about the influence that Remedy's Connected Universe has had on Alan Wake as a series. On the one hand, I do think it's really cool to have characters from Control show up, like Ati or Dr. Darling or Jesse in the DLC, and Control had an Alan Wake DLC as well, which I liked. But Alan Wake has been my favorite game since I was 15 years old, and when I realized that the events of that game were more or less just another altered world world event that the FBC deals with all the time, it made me feel like Remedy made my favorite game less special in a way. And I do feel like the ending of Alan Wake 2 was more interested in setting up Alan for adventures in the Remedyverse rather than concluding Alan's story in a satisfying way. I did have a massive smile on my face though at the part right before the ending when you play as Alan after getting Scratch out of him, and the music and atmospheric sounds from the original game start playing. I also think that the mind play sequence with Saga when she is in the dark place was a really cool twist on established game mechanics. Alan Wake 2 is slated to have two DLC offerings, the first of which is called Night Springs, the second one has not been released yet. Night Springs is separated into three distinct bite-sized episodes which sees the player controlling Rose, Jesse, and Tim in their own episodes. I believe that these episodes are sort of each framed as a failed attempt from Alan to escape the dark place, kind of like American Nightmare, though I don't really know how canon any of these are. Rose's episode, Number One Fan, is a comedic over-the-top action fest that is solely focused on being fun and funny, and does an excellent job at showcasing Remedy's sense of humor. Jesse's episode, North Star, is a much more slow-paced affair, mimicking the pacing of the full game more closely than the first episode. It's mostly focused on puzzle solving and exploring rather than combat. Unfortunately, while Polaris shows up to accompany and help Jesse, she does not have any of her powers or her gun from control. I liked every episode in the DLC, but I liked Jesse's the least. The one I liked the most, however, is Tim's. Timebreaker is a mind-bending, genre-bending, and gameplay-bending adventure, with some truly unique and memorable sequences even compared to the main game. Honestly, I liked Timebreaker so much that I kind of wish that Remedy had just made this one longer instead of having the other two episodes. Ultimately, I think that Night Springs is a very enjoyable, if short, DLC offering. If you liked Alan Wake 2, I would definitely recommend it, just understand that it's a short and sweet sort of thing. Alan Wake 2 is not the game that I wanted it to be necessarily. It took the action-heavy gameplay of Alan Wake and turned it into a slow-paced survival horror game, to a mostly successful end. I love survival horror games, and I love Remedy games, so seeing all the acclaim and accolades that Alan Wake 2 received was fantastic. The game has some industry-leading visuals, as well as fantastic acting, sound design, and music. There were a few technical stumbles, but it didn't fall on its face. The combat is pretty good despite its lack of variety, and the narrative is deep and complex and challenging in both good and sometimes not so good ways. Alan Wake 2 is unashamedly what it is. If you're here for it, great. If you're not, I get it. It's an ambitious artistic achievement, the likes of which we don't often see in gaming. As someone who loves the original game more than any other game I've played, I'm not 100% satisfied with what Alan Wake 2 ended up being but I do think that it's a fantastically unique game that I have come to love in its own right. I am going to give Alan Wake 2 a 9.5 out of 10. You should have seen my reaction when Alan Wake 2 got revealed. I was a little excited. It still feels surreal in a way that I finally played the sequel to Alan Wake after all this time. I am very much looking forward to the next piece of DLC for the game and whatever lies ahead for Alan Wake. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like, subscribing, and commenting your thoughts on the game. Thanks for watching.